Um, so I'm very happy to be in Montreal. <clears throat> I um, try to come often enough. My daughter lives here, but this is a perfect context for me to share my research with you. And I want to thank the organizing committee for uh, having me here. I'm Pat Badani, as I said earlier, I think. Um, I'm an artist, an intermedia artist, and a scholar. Um, and I'm also editor-in-chief of a new media journal called Media N, Journal of the New Media Caucus. Now, I live in Chicago. Uh, that's my uh, last residence for the last 10 years. I previously lived in Paris and so on and so forth. I should say that I have four passports and I've lived in seven countries and I feel at home in all of those places and more. So um, I live in Chicago and as you know, Chicago is in Illinois. Illinois is in the USA Corn Belt, so it should come to you as no surprise that I'm here to talk to you about corn. Um, the title of my essay is Sustainable Agriculture, Sustainable Culture. And in this essay, I discuss a project that I'm working on right now. Um, the project is called Al Grano. Al Grano translates in Spanish, in, in, into English as grain. And um, um, this project addresses the massive industrialization of corn in North America and GM debates um, specifically maize contamination debates in Mexico, center of diversity for this crop. I'm locating the project and research in two specific regions, uh, and these regions I'm personally familiar with. One is um, the Tehuacan Valley in Mexico. And I should say that I lived in Mexico for a decade and that I'm still very much involved uh, with that culture. So to me, that is not an abstraction. This, re this region has personal significance for me. Um, and today, the Tehuacan uh, Valley is um, the center of the debates on, on transgenic maize because maize contamination was found there in 2002. And today, the area is severely impacted by this contamination, and it's at the center of not only GMA debates, but also at the center of water and land use debates. Um, the second region is uh, the um, Illinois, uh, cornified Illinois, as it is commonly called. I lived in Chicago, as I said earlier, but I also taught for about 10 years. I was a professor in an art department in a, in a university in the middle of cornfield. So this region, this um, agricultural region, is very familiar to me because I drove past and through cornfields for about a decade, and um, I'm familiar with farmers and their practices. So during this time, during those 10 years that I uh, worked in that in this area, I have personally witnessed the remaking of the countryside um, and and the, the the remaking also of the family farm as a social body. I see the debates in Mexico as representative of a larger worldwide problem, one that jeopardizes the ecology and our long-term food needs. The increasing erosion of agricultural land and water depletion begs the question, what will we eat in the future? The remaking of the countryside and the family farm as a social body also begs the question, who will grow our food in the future? Eating is a cultural and an agricultural act. And in this last decade, many of us, certainly you in this audience today, have looked at answering the question, where does the food that I'm eating today come from? We know that for the most part, the delivery is made possible by the coordination of vast systems of production, labor, transportation, and fuel systems, all regulated and often subsidized by national structures. And that these structures are furthermore moderated by international corporations and treaties. Speaking for myself, when I learn about what goes on in the food system before that act, the food actually arrives onto my plate, I cannot help but ask myself, is there a better way of doing things? And this is the question that drives uh, my current project. With regards to Mexico, when I look at how things are being done 
in terms of agriculture and the food system, what I see is not pretty. This ugly picture has led me to delve into agricultural practices, both ancient and new, and to investigate the issues related to maize, such as the food sovereignty issues, border crossings, because we're talking about trade, and gene flow, etc., and the cultural identity issues that are entangled in all of these debates. Now, what's distinct about Mexico's relationship to, to corn, quite beyond the millennial creation belief systems, is that Mexican culture revolves around the consumption of that grain across pretty much all economic groups. So much so that maize has been referred to as vitamin T in a staple diet that includes tortillas, tacos, tostadas, totopos, tacayos, and tamales. The association between maize and Mexican culture is so strong, so central, that a commonly used slogan claims, sin maíz, no hay país. And for those of you who are um, English speaking, that translates to, without maize, there is no country. So with this, with this in mind, my essay looks at these questions and these debates. Initially, I give uh, an overview of this contested grain and its contested spaces in North America. I then discuss maize uh, technologies in Mexico from pre-Hispanic times to the present. I include a section about the debates on GM maize contamination, what it's being done today. I conclude the essay by exploring current resistance efforts towards a sustainable agriculture and a sustainable culture where traditional and new technologies can meet and share a place. And this is within North America, Mexico, uh, US, and Canada. So Agrana's perspective into GM maize contamination in Mexico revolves around two main issues. These are my ports of entry into the subject. And the issues are related to diversity at risk. One is biodiversity, and the other one is cultural identity risk. Algrano is inscribed within bio-art practices. It explores cultural narratives and ethnographic contexts that picture art, science, and technology as agents of manipulation and creation. This is a long-term project involving two layers of research. And because I want to reach a variety of audiences, I will use multiple distribution streams for the outputs. One of them would be lecture presentations, such as this one, publications, discussions, exhibitions, websites, and community events, of course. One layer of the project involves collaborations to research non-habitual ways of transforming maize through scientifically-based experiments. The temporal pieces will spawn research essays, visual documents, and other items that can be shared in a variety of platforms, from lecture presentations and publications to performative events and to gallery installations. These experiments will resonate with the social and agricultural transform transformations ne uh, ne uh, thought necessary to challenge the abstraction of farming practices based solely on production and distribution maximization. My goal with these works is to bring to light sustainable possibilities for change. The experiments that I'm actually in the process of conducting are informed by an, an older work of mine dating back to 1997 called Tower Tour. And I call these imagineered drawings or part of a big installation of multi-year, uh, a multi-locational um, project. And these drawings and these installations imagined an ecological technopolis. So in th this earlier project, I also used a mini minuscule grain to inspect um, issues of global pertinence. It wasn't corn at that t time, it was rather wheat. So I mentioned earlier that Algrano has um, two layers. So I've just described one of them, and it's a project in process. So I mostly showed you um, pro projections for the execution of the project or the outcome of the project. The other layer I want to talk about involves film. I interview GMA's debate participants in Canada, the US, and Mexico, such as farm workers, lobbyists, and policymakers. 
The outcome of this research uh, will include theater presentations, online bro bro broadcasts, and um, also a multi-channel video gallery installation. So what I'd like to do now is to show you a video that represents the embodiment of the beginning of this film. Um, and in the video, I showcase not only corn footage, of course, but interviews with two, two Canadian specialists, uh, specialists in the food system and on biodiversity. Uh, one specialist is Elizabeth Fitting, and she's an anthropologist that works in, who works in da, uh, Dalhousie University in, uh, in Canada. And she spent years working in the Tehuacan Valley, the area that I, I mentioned as being the cradle of corn, and it's going to be the, the focus of my own uh, work. And she wrote uh, a wonderful book called uh, The Struggle for Maize, Campesinos, Workers, and Transgenic Corn in the Mexican Countryside. The other specialist is Pat Mooney. He's director of ETC, located in Ottawa. And ETC stands for Erosion, Technology, and Corporate Concentration. They are a lobbying group, and they work cl very closely to the UN, with, with the UN to transform research into actual uh, policy, public policy, and they're very effective in doing that. So uh, with that, having said that, I would like to show the video. GM corn debates, one of the things that has happened is that maize, which has always been a symbol of the Mexican Can you hear? Um, nation, of mm -hmm. Mexicanness, has come to represent Mexican culture really at risk of homogenization in an era of neoliberal globalization. Mexico is the center of biodiversity for this crop. It's an enormously important symbol of what it means to be Mexican. It has become a hot button topic, not just in Mexico, but around the world, because this is the first case where um, GM contamination has gone into a center of diversity, and that's, that's Mexico and that's corn. NAFTA has been a key part of the neoliberal uh, corn regime. These are policies that um, prioritize imports. Mexico is now importing its most culturally important crop. And I think in the case of corn, in the case of maize in Mexico, if we're talking about imported corn, it's yellow corn called pig food. The most important issue, I think, in, in the GM debate in Mexico is really the concerns of, of, of indigenous peasants there who are trying to protect their food security and their food sovereignty. It affects their livelihood, it affects their survival. I mean, they may not survive. In a sense, the okay. geo contamination of the maize crop in Mexico is a case where uh, biopiracy as well, because it's really stealing away the diversity that's been available to, to indigenous peoples there and stealing away their food security uh, in order to impose the, the, uh, the GM rights they want to get, in, the companies want to get into Mexico. Mexico carries on destroying its own genetic diversity in maize, carries on allowing the multinationals into the country, has already granted the intellectual property protection the companies want and is given them the markets they want. We are seeing uh, legal changes to support this kind of corporatization of life, of the seed, of something so fundamental to agricultural production. This is an example of pollution, of genetic pollution. This is an example of contamination. And it's a, a case where, uh, again, the companies said for decades that there was no danger of this kind at all. This would never happen. It wasn't conceivable. And it has happened. 
as a case where the industry initially denied that it was happening, spent years, really, trying to say that the, the data was falsified, it can't be true. Now everyone agrees, yes, it is true, there is GM contamination in Mexico, it's been there for some time. We've, we've had biotech in the field uh, for more than 15 years now, and what have we got to show for? As a reality so far, it's given us almost nothing. Science is controlled by, by uh, corporatism. It's controlled by the combination of what corporate interests are and what government's parallel interests are to those of the corporations. So the public research institutions are as susceptible to bad science, in a way, as, as is the, 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 the agribusiness system. Agribusiness is increasingly involved at every stage of production. The moment politics gets involved in science, science goes out the window. It's the political interests of the companies, the political interests of the government that dominates. They will use science as a weapon and as an excuse to beat down the opposition. The cultural impact of transgenic corn in Mexico is significant and means that, that concern needs to be taken seriously. Maize is such a fundamental crop economically, socially, culturally, politically. There should be better regulations um, and there should be policies to help support the small-scale farmer who relies on uh, traditional varieties. For 4,000 years farmers have saved their seed and they've bread from that seed as well. That grain is also a seed that can be planted and reproduced and exchanged informally or formally. So the diversity again of, of peasant production and the ability of that, that peasant production to respond to climate change is, is vast compared to the industrial model. Food that is produced in the industrial global food system is uh, purged of its cultural and geographic identity. The, the farmers are working in not 150 crops or really 12 crops, they're working in 7,000 different plant species. So their ability to produce diversity that can feed the world and adjust to climate change is again just, you know, by orders of magnitude greater than the companies. It's strange that we're at a, we're at a point in history where uh, this sort of uh, artificial barrier between what I might want to call lab science and field science uh, doesn't have to exist. Uh, uh, we should be able to have a wonderful combination of, of shared interests in, in developing the, the best uh, uh, science we can for, for our long-term food needs. Always recognizing that the solutions are not necessarily technology. The solutions may well be simply good policies. Behind the initial debate over regulation and whether transgenic corn was appropriate technology for Mexico was a debate about the future of the Mexican countryside. The discourse of the government promoted modernizing agriculture or globalizing it. That is to say, if campesinos were to stay in the countryside, they either needed to modernize their maize agriculture, so adopt new technologies, modern varieties, or they needed to abandon corn and take up crops that do better um, in the global market. Really, there's a vision here of transforming campesinos into entrepreneurs or into migrants. In about a decade, half a million agricultural workers were displaced, and we have yet to see exactly um, the full ramifications of this. Who is going to grow that food in the future? Yeah, I think that the, the technologies we're talking about related to biotech are, are, in a sense, being overwhelmed by the realities of both synthetic biology, which is way beyond biotech, and overwhelmed by the geopolitics of geoengineering these days. If you look at what's going to affect as in production in Mexico uh, five years or ten years from now is very much wrapped up in these other technologies which, which most people aren't even aware of now but are going to be as uh, dominating as GMAs is as a topic today. Right, so this is um, a project in gestation so all of this is to be continued and elaborated through the next, I would say, at least three years. It's a, a humongous project and I do invite participants and collaborations, so if you're interested at any level of the two layers that I described um, about the project, please talk to me.
Thank you so much for your time.